Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, and uh, firstly, I wish to uh, welcome you all to this uh, webinar. Um, this is the first uh, underwater culture heritage webinar on the occasion of the Ocean Day. And in preparation of the ocean uh, uh, science uh, decade. Well, um, my name is Ahmed Khalil. I am a professor of maritime archaeology at the University of Alexandria, uh, Egypt. And, um, and I wish to welcome everyone and wish you all a happy World Oceans Day. Well, as you probably know, um, the United Nations decade, uh, the United Nations uh, uh, SDG 14 conference, um, SDG 14, which is the Sustainable Development Goal 14, conference was supposed to be held um, these days in Lisbon, in Portugal. But however, obviously, during, due to the COVID situation, uh, we couldn't, it's not, it's not be possible to, to hold the conference. And the, uh, for, for those who are attending the, uh, the uh, webinar, the, um, um, the, uh, the SDG 14, the Sustainable Development Goal 14, is to conserve uh, and sustainably use the ocean seas and marine resources and this is where we uh, we find maritime archaeology and underwater archaeology fits therefore we are very proud uh, to offer this virtual uh, initiative and to draw attention to the importance of uh, cultural heritage of our oceans um, i sincerely wish to thank unesco for organizing the whole thing and for technical support and for uh, all the valuable uh, uh, advices uh, on this matter, and uh, I would like to thank the uh, Scientific and Technical Advisory Body, the STAB of the 2001 Convention, also the Ocean Decade Heritage Network, and we will hear about this uh, shortly. Uh, obviously, the uh, Unit 2 Network for Underwater Archaeology, and of course, every and single one of our elite experts and, um, and attendees as well. Um, as you, as you probably know, I mean, it's needless to say that the oceans are very crucial for uh, our life. Therefore, we need to ensure that all aspects of the oceans are recognized. We also need to ensure that the change is made in enhancing cooperation in science. There is a sincere and uh, genuine need for collaboration and for taking true steps uh, for, uh, for change. Um, and um, I'll just give you a uh, uh, some uh, housekeeping before we get started. Uh, each presenter have uh, 10 minutes, so please stick to the time. Um, as Alexandra mentioned repeatedly, please mute your mic and cameras when you are not using them. And uh, to ask questions, please use the uh, question and answer tool at the bottom line of, the, of your page. And at the end of the uh, webinar, there will be a, a space for public debate and it will allow, would allow uh, questions and answers from the, from the public, so this would be possible. Uh, for asking questions, you can uh, use um, English, French, and Spanish, but the presentations are all held uh, in English. And of course, uh, the event will be uh, recorded as, uh, as, uh, as has been listed on the announcement. Um, so we're gonna start now with uh, the first uh, uh, presentation by Tawfiq Kamoum uh, from Algeria and uh, Lazaro Lundu, and Taufik uh, Hamoum, uh, he is the chairperson of the uh, STAB of the UNESCO uh, uh, Convention uh, um, uh, Scientific and Technical Advisory Body, and he is also the director of the Algerian National Archaeological Research uh, Center. And uh, Lazaro Lundu um, is uh, the director of the UNESCO's uh, Culture and uh, Emergencies. So uh, the floor is yours, and you have uh, 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed. Welcome for all. Uh, Mr. Lazar Elandu, Secretary of the 2001 Convention, Dear Professor Ahmed Ali, Executive Director of the Center for Maritime Archaeology, Underwater Cultural Heritage, and Moderator of the webinar. Dear colleagues, member of the Scientific and Technical Advisory Board, dear speakers and participants. In this time of COVID-19, let me first wish all of you a happy Ocean's Day. 
as a president of, uh, of the Scientific and Technical Advisory Board, I want to welcome you to this webinar on the topic of underwater archaeology and ocean science. Let me start by thanking for uh, Professor Ahmed Khalil for having accepted to moderate this session. I am sure that his extensive knowledge on this topic will help us during the discussion that we will have. The Scientific and Technical Advisory Board, the STAB, which is a council of 14 experts to advise the meeting of state parties of the 2001 Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage, was requested to work on the integration of underwater cultural heritage into the work of the next United Nations decade. This webinar is therefore important to listen to your views on the best way to ensure such integration of underwater cultural heritage. As you know, our planet has only one ocean with many features. Everything is interlinked. To protect it, we need to understand it. The humanity cannot be understood without the ocean. The ocean makes us who we are and also what, what we were over millions of years. I wish you all a good meeting and thank you, Mr. Ahmed and all. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tofi. Uh, and um, I mean, I, I know I'm part of this, but I have to be honest that Tofi is doing an excellent job in the, uh, in the stab. Actually, he's very, very uh, accurate and he's pushing us all the time and he's emailing us like five times a day and making sure that we are working hard. So uh, my greetings, sincere greeting to Tofi uh, for managing the stab. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you. And now Thank you. The words is for uh, for Lazar, who is also an incredible help with with the staff. Thank you. Go ahead, Lazar. Thank you, Thank you uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Emma Khalil. Uh, mine is also um, a kind of uh, um, uh, welcoming uh, message, uh, and I like to do it also on behalf of the uh, the management of uh, of UNESCO, and in particular, uh, Mr. Ernesto Otone, the Assistant Director General for Culture. So I would like really, again, like already done by uh, the President, uh, Professor Tufik Amum, to welcome you to this very important webinar to discuss uh, underwater archaeology uh, and the ocean uh, sciences. But first of all, um, I hope that, that you, uh, your families, and your loved ones are doing well in these difficult times. Uh, which uh, I will call the difficult times of collective fragility. As the, the director of culture and emergencies, but also the secretary of the 2001 convention, I'm delighted to see that uh, participant to this webinar uh, represent you know, the wider ocean science and underwater archaeology uh, communities. Um, so uh, uh, I really uh, would like to greet, uh, in particular, as already done by uh, Pre uh, Professor uh, Tufik Amum, uh, the speakers uh, who will be sharing their expertise and views today with us. But what also I'd like to say is that the idea of this webinar comes from uh, also a consultation with staff members launched on 1st of May last uh, to submit ideas on the celebration of the United Nations uh, Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Uh, so this webinar uh, is organized, of course, in the framework of the preparation of uh, the ocean decades. And of course, based on 
uh, this um, the initial discussions uh, that we had uh, at the last unit twin meeting uh, held in the uh, end of April, uh, staff members felt really necessary to uh, organize this webinar uh, where speakers could elaborate uh, what, uh, and now I'm going to use the, the words uh, of Professor uh, Emad Khalil uh, when uh, he was explaining uh, to the staff members and, uh, and to us that it was important to elaborate the link between uh, uh, underwater cultural heritage and ocean sciences. Uh, because uh, today there is a perception that many uh, oceanographers, you know, ocean scientists, and even politicians like uh, Professor uh, Emad Khalil uh, clearly uh, said with us, uh, who still perceive uh, underwater cultural heritage as quite irrelevant to ocean science. And we all know that this is not true. So we here as the UNESCO Secretariat to the 2001 Convention, we're therefore proud to have facilitated uh, with my colleagues. Uh, and I think Ulrike will be uh, speaking on behalf of, uh, of us to uh, the view uh, from the 2001 Convention. Uh, uh, and we're very proud to do it also on this very occasion, which is important, which is the occasion of the World Ocean Day, uh, uh, this uh, uh, webinar. Finally, uh, again, I'd like to thank all those who were um, involved in, uh, in, in preparing uh, this, in addition to, 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 to the staff members. I also would like to really thank uh, the Center for Maritime Archaeology and under what the cultural heritage of the Faculty of Arts in Alexandria, uh, and uh, which you are leading, uh, uh, Professor uh, Emer Khalil. So really, uh, we want to express our gratitude. And of course, as you said, also uh, the Ocean Decade Heritage Network, uh, the University of Southampton, ECOMOS also, and many others who are involved and, uh, and uh, who are part of, of, of this events and who made it happen. And we're really happy to say so. I really want to wish you a fruitful seminar. And um, I would like now to, uh, to, to, again, to hand over to you, uh, Professor Khalil, to moderate the session. And also, again, to sincerely thank you for your unbelievable kindness in accepting to play this role. Thank you very much and over to you. The pleasure is sincerely all mine, uh, Lazar. I'm really glad uh, to do this. And um, actually, the word collective fragility was really accurate. And this is true. I mean, I think it's for the first time, uh, as far as I'm aware, that the whole world is brought together for one cause, for one target. And I think the oceans should be something like this. I mean, the whole world should be uh, working together for our oceans and for our resources, just as we are working together now to, to get through this crisis. So Hopefully, this is just a first step for further collaborative, coherent, solid work for uh, one cause and one, uh, one reason. So um, I'm completely agreeing with you on this. Um, and the, again, I wish, I wish to, to stress on the support that we are receiving from UNESCO and from the Secretary for uh, these activities and for further activities. And I'm sure that this is just a step, a beginning of more uh, solid, coherent work, especially after this crisis uh, comes over and we can, you know, see each other face to face and be together in, in one, uh, one place, inshallah, soon. Uh, thank you, Lazar, and thank you for, for, the, for the intervention. And now we, we go to our first um, uh, presenters, and this would be um, uh, Lucy Blue and uh, Fraser uh, Sturt from the University of Southampton. And uh, uh, Lucy is, is yani, she does not need an introduction. But um, she is the senior lecturer of uh, archaeology, uh, of maritime archaeology at the uh, University of Southampton and the Ar uh, maritime archaeological director of the Honor Frost Foundation. And above all, she is my supervisor and my professor. And um, yeah, I mean, she taught me personally a lot. Yeah. Um, and then we have Fraser Sturt from the um, University of Southampton as well. He's a professor of maritime archaeology and the deputy director of the Southampton Marine and Maritime Institute. And again, he is my colleague. We had masters together at the same year. 
Um, so uh, 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 Lucy and Fraser will talk about uh, historic uh, sites and ancient tracks in the Black Sea, uh, essential for understanding the human relation with the oceans. Um, Fraser and Lucy, go ahead, please. Brilliant. Can you hear us, Emad? Yes, perfect. Excellent. Well, in which case, thank you for having us to speak on World, uh, World Oceans Day, and we are really pleased to be here because as Lazar's picked up, this is really critical, we think, to the delivery and maximizing the potential for the decade. And we want to start with a slide that comes from the decade's own publication, that the objective is to deliver the science we need for the ocean that we want. And this raises lots of opportunities and lots of questions in terms of how do we define and understand that scientific need, but also what is the societal desire and drive of who are we and how do we collectively determine what we want. And we want to pick out two things here in terms of ocean scientists working with archeologists, but also archeologists as ocean scientists. And we're gonna quickly take you through in no more than 10 minutes at three different projects looking at that. And to follow on from what Lazar said, this is in relation to the sustainable development goals. And many people looking at these on their first look don't see the place of culture or of archeology span within them. But if you dig deeper to each of these SDGs, there is a strong cultural and in many of them archeological component. Be that from how we sustainably manage our growth in terms of its impact on the archeological record and how we maintain a sense of identity, but also in terms of how we provide a human narrative and understanding for things such as climate change. And as we'll go on to argue, also how we generate that critical data. If we look within the decade of ocean science in terms of the identified knowledge gaps, many of these are critical to archeology, span but also archeology span is helping to address. So we're not just an end user and a consumer, we are also a producer of scientific data. The statement is that only 5% of the ocean floor has been mapped at high resolution, and 80% of it is largely unmapped, and that 99% of marine habitable areas are poorly understood. This has significant implications for archaeology, and this is why archaeologists are doing research in this area. To work you through this, uh, UNESCO put forward the hypothesis uh, that there must be around 3 million shipwrecks worldwide. Now, if we've only mapped 5% of the ocean seabed surface at high resolution, how do we manage this resource? How do we access that which is most informative or critical to understanding of the world or human development? Now, to help you envisage this, this is what 3 million wrecks might look like. And here, each dot is 34.3 wrecks. I've just distributed them roughly equally around the world's oceans and seas. You see the mass of anthropogenic material that might be or is existing on the seabed and probably in clusters far more concentrated than it indicates here. And that's an incredible resource, but not just from archeologists, but from marine scientists wanting to understand the impacts of anthropogenic structures on the seafloor and also how biological communities grow. So this is an opportunity for all um, marine scientists. And it's more than wrecks. Archeologists are fundamentally interested in how our planet has changed and humanity with it. If we go back in time through ice ages, sea levels have fluctuated by more than 120 meters, reconfiguring our landscapes and oceanscapes. Now these submerged paleo landscapes contain critical information on our early ancestors, but also how the oceans have changed in terms of circulatory patterns. Now this is pivotal information, not just for archeologists, but for climate models as well. So these archives are shared archives and they're ones which we're collectively investigating. Now, I've been lucky enough to be involved in a number of projects. And this one is led by John Adams out of Southampton, which is doing more than thinking about this hypothetically, but is taking extensive action at the cutting edge to address them. So the Black Sea Map Project worked with maritime industry, particularly MMT, cutting edge robotics, to try and address that challenge of how do we get beyond the 5% using new techniques to create data of a different resolution. And that gives us these wonderful images, such as wrecks like this, over a thousand years old, which are fundamental to our understanding of the past, and there is John, answering questions about technology and transportation, but also of pivotal interest to biologists. These are experiments we could never conduct. What happens if you put an anthropogenic structure in the sea and leave it for a thousand years? The communities and microorganisms that grow. And even more, how do we understand and map the process of sea level change and human impact? Here are some of the cores uh, and the bathymetric data from the Black Sea project. 
And within this incredibly fine-grained record, we can pick out that story of changing ecosystems and changing human behavior. This is the fundamental heart of the decade for ocean science, and this is how we define the science that we might need to tell that story better. And on to Helen Farr. Thank you, Fraser. So moving to the other side of the world, another project. This one is the ACROSS project. It's an ERC-funded project studying some of the earliest seafaring in global history, trying to uh, bring uh, new knowledge and new information to big questions of human origins and our changing planet. We're studying seafaring into Sahul, modern day Australia and New Guinea in deep time. And to do this, we need to understand the changing land and the changing seascape and the now submerged paleo landscapes of the Northern Australian shelf. This approach is a combination of multiple forms of ocean science and the recognition of the importance of indigenous history and knowledge. Whilst the chronology and notion of arrival of people into Sahul is debated, new dating of archaeological sites and dating of older sites suggest people were in Sahul by at least 65,000 years ago. But an alternative and accepted ontology of many Aboriginal peoples is that they have always been there, and thus neither arrived nor came from somewhere else. Different forms of knowledge may be difficult to coalesce, but bring richness to the narratives we can tell both about oceans and ocean science and sustainability, but also about culture and being human. These aims speak to SDGs for partnerships, education and reduced inequalities. Next slide, please. Thank you. We've been understanding changing seascapes to understand both seafaring and life on the coast in deep time, running powerful ocean circulation models, which are essential to global climate models and understanding climate change through the glacial cycles. For example, marine isotope stages six to two. And alongside these ocean circulation models, we're mapping paleo tides with changing sea levels and the geomorphology of the coast. Both these things inform us about the changing coastal environment and changing ecozones, but also the available resources and lived habitats, fitting with the SDGs and climate change, life below the water and life on land. Next slide, please. Thank you. A big part of this project involves using offshore industry data and 2 in 3 d seismic analysis to understand the changing nature of the now submerged coastal landscape changing features and changing environments, as can be seen on the bottom left of this slide by this map of the changing fluvial system, now drowned and in the bay of the, Gona, uh, of the Bonaparte Gulf, as seen on the right. Through this research, we are developing new methodologies, especially in near-surface seismic data analysis and interpretation, which will feed back into industry and marine science. But also, and this is, uh, this is critical, oh, sorry, Fraser. Sorry, there you go. <laughs> um, but also, and this is critical for questions of sustainable, develop sustainable development, using offshore data collected for extraction purposes, i.e. oil and gas, and turning it from raw seismic data into landscapes that were once inhabited, indigenous uh, country and sea country, and in some places, these submerged landscapes are still remembered lands, part of a rich and deep cultural heritage and oral tradition. And it's this transformation of marine science data, which is vital in, uh, in our analysis, but vital for goals of education and partnership through the, throughout the decade. Okay, thank you, Fraser, over to Lucy. <laughs> Thanks, Helen, can you hear me? Yep. Um, okay, so finally we're moving from the seabed into space. Um, I'd like to introduce very briefly um, a five-year project that I'm co-organizing with my colleague Colin Breen in the University of Ulster that's funded by Arcadia and essentially aims to document maritime cultural heritage. Um, it primarily uses satellite imagery uh, to document sites and to demonstrate, as illustrated in the image that you see generated in front of us here, time series data to not only document but also to monitor coastal change um, through time. Um, this essentially feeds into SDG objectives relating to sustainability through cities and communities and it provides open access database that can be used in the management of the maritime cultural resource. 
Can I have the next slide, please? So by observing coastal landscapes over time, Maria also feeds into monitoring the impact of climate change, uh, SDD 13, uh, whilst also providing data that understands environmental change at different timescales. So the example, um, that is illustrated on the image in front of you. And yes, Kieran, this is an example of your image. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Shows in the, in the top of the slide, um, an example from Syria um, that basically demonstrates siltation of an ancient natural anchorage over thousands of years that has more recently been observed through satellite imagery being subject to coastal retreat of up to 2.5 meters per year. This and the example at the bottom of the slide that illustrate direct impact of coastal erosion on the site of Apollonia in Libya, and I'd like to thank my colleague Julia for this example, is lit, which, is, which is literally demonstrating the site being um, eaten by the sea. Again, the project therefore showing not only the monitoring, but also the vital um, scientific data that um, the MARIA project can bring to understanding these coastal processes and change through time. But finally, and importantly, Maria is also working with regional authorities to determine sustainable strategies for coastal management, therefore feeding into SDG 17. So to sum up, yes, thanks, Rosa, now I can have that. <laughs> um, we, uh, the, the, the ocean, uh, sorry, to sum up, we are identifying the science that we need and we want in order to determine the ocean that we want. Archaeologists are working with ocean scientists, as hopefully has been demonstrated through this uh, presentation, but they are also working as ocean scientists. And finally, the big take home message is that culture is critical to the delivery of SDGs, as has been demonstrated from the outset of this workshop, and therefore by default to the objectives of the decade of ocean. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. Fraser and Helen. I was not informed that Helen will be presenting, I'm sorry. So Helen Farr is a lecturer um, uh, at the University of Southampton and she's also a lecturer at the um, Southampton Marine and Maritime Institute. So thank you very much for Fraser, Helen and for uh, Lucy. Uh, I'll just take uh, from uh, Fraser's words and uh, he said that uh, ocean scientists working with archaeologists and now we are having archaeologists who are also ocean scientists. And this is quite interesting because I think 20 or 30 years ago, archaeologists were conceived to be those guys who are studying the humanities aspects of, of things. Uh, but now we are having more and more archaeologists who are actually scientists, like Fraser and Helen and Lucy and others. And it is, it is those people who, who can demonstrate the link or the, the strong link between uh, maritime and Aluha archaeology and between ocean sciences. So thank you very much for uh, this very interesting uh, presentation. Um, and now we, knew, we move to our uh, uh, next speaker, which is uh, Auric Goron from the Secretary of the UNESCO 2001 Convention uh, on the Protection of Monumental Culture Heritage. And uh, Auric does not need any introduction. I mean, she's well known by everyone who works in this field. I have known Auric for decades, and she has been always there supporting before anyone. And um, I think she knows about this more than any of us, although she's not an archaeologist, as she's always say, but I think she's now. Uh, can be accredited archaeologist after all these years. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's your, uh, your word, uh, Orik. Go ahead. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to talk to all of you from all corners of the world. Um, we have 800 inscribed participants. It's quite fantastic that there was so much interest. So we will certainly redo this. My name, as I was already presented, is Ulrike Guerin. Uh, I'm from UNESCO in the uh, Secretariat of the 2001 Convention. I'm also the person that is handling the questions and answers in this Zoom tool, so please make use of that. We will make sure that your questions will be handed over. In my presentation, I will be joined by Bill Jeffrey, Professor Bill Jeffrey from University of Guam. So virtual uh, modernism allows us to talk in the same moment from two different corners of the world. We literally opposed. So isn't this fantastic? We are all one big ocean and we're talking from different corners of this one big ocean. My topic is 
what actually can underwater cultural heritage bring to the world? Why should we do underwater ecology? Why is underwater cultural heritage important for ocean sciences, uh, also for ocean literacy? And why should actually anyone listen to us? Let us first shortly look into what is actually ocean literacy. You all know that oceans is a big theme in this moment. Uh, you know, ocean are threatened, uh, ocean are polluted, uh, there's not enough fish. We don't know anything about oceans. And actually it's 71% of our world. There's much more ocean in this, in this place, in this planet, than there's actually uh, uh, Earth. So ocean literacy has seven major principles, and I just picked out some to speak about them today. One is in number four, the ocean made Earth habitable. I think that is really what it says for us all, for every human being, for every one of us who participates in this uh, workshop, the ocean, only the ocean, makes this earth habitable. Then also, the ocean and humans are inextricably interconnected. No oceans, no humans. And the ocean is largely unexplored as this fantastic presentation that we heard before already said. But what is that? I always say humans do not breathe. And it's very difficult to actually look into the water. As museums for the moment expose underwater archaeological heritage, certainly full of them, but they leave very often the archaeological context out. They leave actually the ocean out. Land scientists stop at the beach and ocean scientists focus very often on economically related topics. So for the moment, there's a true lack of interconnection. And that's what all the time is said when you hear the talks about the ocean science decade that starts next year, big UN ocean science decade, uh, about all these works on SDG 14 for the oceans. You know, we have a problem to interconnect. And also, you know, we have also a problem to talk to the outside world. Here is a little image. I mean, this is basically a very bad joke, but what most people see looking at the oceans is just the water surface. And that counts not so much only for underwater culture heritage, that counts for all kinds of ocean research. Had they looked beneath, they would have seen fantastic things. For instance, here there was a shipwreck lying at the bottom of the, of the sea. But it's very difficult to look beneath and to also look beneath at all points of the ocean. When you hear 5% of the ocean are only yet explored. I mean, there's nothing. It's basically just our backyard and not more. Underwater culture heritage and all coastal heritage as well is actually crucial when you look at the oceans. There's a living connection of the humans with the sea. And I will later hand over to Bill Jeffrey, who knows this much better and who's much closer to the oceans than us here at UNESCO headquarters in Paris. People across oceans have always maintained a daily connection to the sea. And I do not talk about the tourists that went, until still recently, I would say, to the beach to have fun at the beach. There have been so many generations and generations of people crossed the sea, um, you know, lived from the sea, adored and admired the sea. So what is actually the ocean for us? No, it's not only an economical ground. It is much more. It's a part of us. There are cultural practices from thousands of years ago, millennia, we wouldn't be what we are today if there wouldn't have been the oceans. And also climate change, of course, had and has and also will have a profound impact on all people. So that's to say, to say uh, oceans are culture, oceans are our culture and we are part of them. And if we want today to talk about the oceans, to address the public, to address the scientists, and to say, what should we do in the future? And why should we actually do it? Why should we care? We talk, we have to talk of the human factor. You cannot say, you know, this is just because it brings money. No, there's so much more. It's for us because this is our culture. Let's look at some topics that, that are so important in today's world. We talk so much about them and it's really an issue. Climate change. The there are so many prehistoric sites underwater that give testimony to the impact on humans. Thousands and thousands of prehistoric sites. Humanity developed in fertile space as big as Latin America, taken together, that is today underwater. Dogger land, that is North Sea, the Black Sea itself, the parts of the Caribbean, the whole bottom of the Persian Sea. That is where humanity developed, and the traces of that are underwater. 
that there's so much data, knowledge on human development and adaptation to climate change. How can we actually uh, talk about this knowledge and look at the status quo and at the future if we do not look at the past? There are so big projects ongoing. You just heard this from our uh, fantastic chair of our Unitary Network from Southampton. We cannot ignore this kind of data, but there's more to that as well. You will hear this later in the webinar that we have today, ocean pollution. Ocean pollution is not just what we throw today at the, in the ocean. That's a lot from, from the past. Look at the World War I and World War II shipwrecks, for instance. And not only shipwrecks, also other materials that have been thrown at the moment or you know, ended up unwillingly in the ocean. There are thousands and thousands of shipwrecks full of unexploded ordnance, of petrol, of chemicals, and those uh, hulls are very often made out of metal. They are corroding, they are, you know, shrinking away. You certainly might have, you know, read the articles about the Titanic shrinking away, but this is the same thing with all other metal shipwrecks as well. Let me give you an example. USS Missinaver was a big shipwreck in Micronesia that in February 2003 began to leak oil. Two million US gallons or 7,600 cubic meter have been taken out of the shipwreck because otherwise it would have created a major catastrophe. But who's actually looking at this shipwreck? Our colleges. So talk to them. We need to talk to our colleges. Otherwise, same for global warming. Global warming is, of course, impacting heritage substantially. There are shipwrecks uh, eroding, shipwrecks expanding, and also waters rising and destroying a lot of prehistoric sites that are very often on the beach, also historic sites like the tidal wear that you see here. The global warming is making the waters rise and they can destroy whole islands. But this also means they are destroying living spaces, cultural landscapes, our culture of what we are and what we were. There is a big, big importance to be paid to the human relation to the ocean. Ocean is not only do we have something to fish and sell. Oh no, so much more. There is traditional knowledge over thousands of years collected. Seascapes developed by wayfinders, seafarers, you know, the whole culture that was seafaring, fish traps that were used, ocean related ceremonies that have been developed all over the world in all places. When there was already shortly mentioned in the presentation before, the Australian dream landscapes partly still reach out into the ocean space because ancient, in ancient times, this was actually dry land. This is actually fantastic to see that the ocean uh, has such a big influence on our being, on our what we are. So ocean literacy cannot be talked about without talking about our past. What has actually made us dream about uh, the sea, about uh, uh, anything that has to do with the ocean? Vasco da Gama going to the other parts of, of, of the world to go to India. Um, the Odyssey, when Odyssey, uh, uh, Odysseus uh, uh, um, bent over the waters, Columbus, all these uh, seafarer uh, women are making us dream. So um, this is really important to see ocean literacy is something that is alive. I hand over to Bill Jeffrey, who will give you a, just a living example. Thank you very much, Ulrike. Thank you for allowing uh, us to bring in the uh, intangible cultural heritage, or what we call living heritage here in Oceania. Um, uh, just a very quick uh, historical uh, recap. Uh, Austronesian people, um, Austronesian speaking people, that is, have a long cultural connection with the sea, with Southeast Asia, and uh, the Pacific, or in other words, Oceania. Uh, right across to Rapa Nui, uh, New Zealand was the last place, um, 800 BP, um, settled by Austronesian speaking people, and right across to almost to the uh, coast of Africa. They develop uh, many cultural practices in, in, as part of the navigation, they call it wayfinding, and they also uh, developed a complex system, exchange systems between islands. Uh, there were no borders in those days. Uh, Melanesia, Micronesia and Polynesia, you see here, are European terms that only came about in the 19th century. The islanders' world uh, did not stop at the edge of the island. Uh, their world included the sea that connected to other islands uh, and to this through these exchange systems. The next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. So uh, I want to talk briefly about the fish weirs. Uh, many cultural practices 
developed uh, in regard to fishing. Uh, and uh, fish were and still are the major staple for many uh, uh, protein for many islanders. Uh, this particular uh, fish we hear is called an atch in uh, Yappi. Uh, Yap is part of the FSM, Federated States of Micronesia. This one here is about 100 meters long. It's made out of basalt stones, the size of a football, maybe uh, several thousand that would take two, a couple of years to build. So this is on a tidal reef flat. That, uh, this is uh, exposed now, but the water comes in, uh, fish come in, they're grazing there, and when the water recedes, the fish are trapped in the uh, arrow shape there. So uh, uh, Yappies believe that spirits built the first seven atch, they call the atch, uh, and this helped guide them in how to build the rest of the 800 or so atch, and they built them to show them how to make them sustainable. Uh, they are the atch are really are high in biodiversity they're higher in biodiversity than outside of the atch so that this has a uh, an association with climate change or uh, when there's climate of people uh, they inside the atch can be quite well protected and uh, a high biodiversity and a food source for islanders at those sort of times they can also be helping coastal and stopping coastal erosion and one nice uh, example I have to share, um, the Yappies told me that it stopped warring canoes sneaking across the reef flat uh, and coming because the, the tide was, you know, the water was there, the other warring canoe didn't know where the, the fish weir were, so that they, they got caught, their deep hole canoes got caught on, the, on these uh, basalt rock uh, fish weirs. So the next um, slide, please. So Austronesian speaking people through Southeast Asia are known to live and work in harmony with the natural and spiritual world, as can be seen here in the rice terraces and the irrigation system in Bali, which is a World Heritage Site. Inshore fishing, uh, using the Atch in, in Yap and many other parts of Oceania and Southeast Asia where the fish was, they simply carried out um, their fishing in harmony with the natural and spiritual world. The many customs and cultural practices kept the fishing sustainable until modern techniques uh, and equipment and the selling of fish, the, uh, the freezers that you could store fish and you didn't have, that destroyed the harmony and balance that there was there. This balance called traditional ecological knowledge is something we need to reconnect to in association with protecting and revitalizing the use of fish weirs, the living heritage. Uh, throughout Asia Pacific and Oceania. Thanks, Arupi. Thanks a lot, Bill. And it's fantastic to get uh, this kind of input from the other side of the oceans where the waters are rising and where there's a real issue and a lot of discussion about climate change and, of course, also about the, the loss of culture through this climate change. So what we want to say uh, from our part, for all the partner network from UNESCO, we have an obligation when we look at the ocean preservation to also look at the protection of underwater culture heritage, of coastal heritage, and all our cultural traditions. There is an obligation from, for us to search this interconnect. We shouldn't look in starting next year, take underwater culture heritage into account, and also get capacity, scale up and inform yourself. Support us, we will support you, please rely on us. We know that there have been many questions about uh, training opportunities, connection opportunities. We're happy to be part of the UN Ocean Science Decade. Connect, share, engage, support the 2001 Convention of UNESCO. I hand back to Emma Khalil. Rick, thank you very much for uh, Rick and uh, and Bill for the uh, for the presentation. And uh, um, I mean, the first the first thing Rick said was uh, a question that is often posed: um, Why should anyone talk to us? Um, this is the big question. I mean, this is basically the reason this initiative of this webinar is taking place, and other initiatives are taking place. And I think Rick and Bill's presentation clearly and cleverly answered and elaborated on this on this topic. And it demonstrated all the different uh, um, venues or, or different um, uh, aspects 
um, between um, uh, archaeologists and, and the ocean. And uh, this is something that have continu has to continuously be promoted and stressed on. So thank you very much, much Auric uh, and, and Bill for the presentation. Uh, one one uh, housekeeping again, please stick to the 10 minutes um, time for your presentations. And if the uh, presentation is done by more than one person, it's still 10 minutes. So please, for everyone else, uh, try to stick to the uh, designated time. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, now our second, our, uh, our next presenter will be Chris Underwood, the president of the Ecomus International Committee for Underwater Culture Heritage. And Chris, I guess, is, is known for everyone and he has extensive um, uh, experience in, in this field and he was one of the pioneers um, who started um, um, uh, outreach and public engagement in, uh, in maritime archaeology and uh, Chris will be talking to us about the decade of the ocean science for sustainable development, opportunities, synergies and partnerships. Chris Underwood. Uh, thanks Emmet, thanks Professor Ahmed, um, thanks Ulrike, thanks for the previous speakers with, from Southampton. Um, I sat here with my mouth open looking at uh, Southampton's projects and uh, I've taken a slightly different view as um, president of ICUC. Um, I represent a lot of people who I hope that during the next 10 years will, will um, contribute significantly to the, the uh, Decade of Ocean Science and Sustainable Development. And I've taken a view of that some of our listeners will perhaps not be so familiar with the, the infrastructure and perhaps how, can, how to get involved. So I'd like to run through my presentation relating to what um, underwater cultural heritage management may contribute, some of the um, obvious synergies, obvious partnerships and obvious opportunities that we all have to share in this, this wonderful opportunity called the decade. Um, could I have the first slide, please, or unless you can see mine? Sorry, can you see my uh, presentation? Not yet. Ah. Yeah, now we can. Now you can. Okay, fantastic. moving. Next slide, please. So I want to take a step back to the first planning meeting, which in a sense kick-started my own personal journey in understanding um, what the decade um, was about, and certainly trying to understand how uh, underwater culture heritage could play a significant part. I, these are personal reflections and the no distinction between natural and cultural heritage was part of the opening plenary session and that was extremely encouraging and I think relating to what Fraser said earlier is that when I arrived I, I already came with that view. I didn't see why we weren't ocean marine scientists. It's, it's a case of cultural heritage, maritime archaeologists, working with other marine scientists, not actually creating something new. What I was particularly stunned by was one comment was ocean too big to fail. And while I was very aware of climate change and aware of the threat to the ocean, this was something quite stark. And from my personal point of view, it's a case of how do we contribute? How can we clean the ocean? How can we prepare an ocean that we want in the future that provides for all our needs and include underwater culture heritage? I was also struck by the comment out of sight, out of mind. And for many of us involved in public archaeology, as I've been for quite some time, out of sight, out of mind is quite um, important because we think, as Ulrike showed in the previous presentation, people look at the, the sea and they don't obviously and sometimes naturally think about what actually is beneath the sea. So I felt we had the same challenges with the natural heritage community. But the big message coming out of this was open access and data sharing and citizen science. And these are extremely important in terms of delivering the, the decade as we move through the, the next 10 years. Next slide, please. And the concept of big data, and I think um, going back to the previous speakers that this has already been mentioned in a sense as a consequence of what they're doing. And also in terms of managing the seabed has created 
a lot of data that has existed in my own personal um, memory for at least 40 years. So I think a point to be made is there's already data sitting in people's data sets in their computers that we should find some mechanism for sharing with the broader community, not just the heritage community, but the natural heritage community too. And what also came out of this is that data acquisition and standards and open access. And data acquisition, we're all very familiar with, um, certainly in our community with multi-beam, side scan, all the other wonderful technologies that have been on, on show already, including the satellite imagery shown by Lucy. But it's a case of acquiring that data and persuading perhaps our partners from the natural heritage community to take account of what our community might value in the future. So standards became an issue that was discussed some of the breakout groups during the, um, the first planning meeting in Copenhagen. Mutual standards are extremely helpful. And remembering that if we provide information regarding perhaps concentrations of where we believe underwater cultural heritage may be, maybe our natural cultural heritage scientists could tune up their high definition multi-beam side scan and perhaps produce data that would be extremely useful to our um, community, as well as in reciprocating by providing data in return. And you can see from this slide, I see that our management of, of particularly related to preservation in situ, contributes to objective one and objective three through 1.2 and 3.1. And you can see these um, on the IOC uh, website, of course. Next slide, please. And for many years, and I said previously for at least 40 years, we've been measuring um, seabed characteristics because it's very important for preservation in situ, but also in looking at detailed sites that can help with the management of the ocean as well and management of change. Next slide, please. This has already been mentioned, but I thought it would be useful to put some detail to this. We know there are many thousands of shipwrecks. I think Fraser said 3 million is an estimate. We also know that there are many thousands of ships from the 20th century, some of which actually fall within the definition of UNESCO um, cultural heritage or within the 100 year um, parameter. But many of them, and perhaps what isn't known, there are nearly 2000 of those wrecks contain oil or other toxic car cargo and also accumulate fishing nets. And these provide opportunity for monitoring sites by not just science, let's say professional scientists, but also the citizen science. These programs are growing um, rapidly, and I see a very, very big opportunity for citizen science in the, in the monitoring of shipwreck around the world. They can be local, they can be regional, or even international. Next slide, please. An existing program, certainly throughout Europe, is the GhostNet uh, marine litter cleanup projects like GhostNets. And these have an implication for ourselves in the underwater cultural heritage community. You can see on the slides here, apart from the diver measuring and taking sort of assessment of, of what's actually happening, these are tools that have been recommended for use within the marine litter cleanup project. And you can see that the, the use of these are going to be detrimental to underwater cultural heritage sites. It's therefore essential that underwater cultural heritage managers and maritime archaeologists through citizen science may be, are involved in these projects. Next slide, please. Ocean literacy has been mentioned quite a lot. Within the, the framework of the UNESCO convention and certainly ICUCH, there are existing organizations who are very much involved in ocean literacy. The Recreational Diving Community, one of the CMAS uh, is an accredited NGO. They're an international community that can help with ocean literacy through their diving instruction, but also through the events that they promote. Maritime Museums, the International Congress of Maritime Museums, we should be working with them to promote Decade of Ocean Science uh, promotions. Open access sharing, we've been through that. Media is super important, and we, I know that the Decade and uh, I assume the UNESCO Convention and ICUCH will be working very closely with media to promote the decade. Also within the framework of the 2001 Convention, there are a range of 
accrediting in NGOs who are already extremely experienced in working with and promoting underwater cultural heritage with a broader public and with recreational diving groups. All opens the door to system and science, and I know following speakers will shed some more light on that. So next, next slide, please. I also thought it would be useful to look at what the decade action endorsement was like. A little framework. And just very briefly, you'll see on the left-hand side of the screen, a decade programme is global or regional. It tends, that'll be more than one country and possibly more than one decade objective. It can be long term. That is taken to mean longer than one year. It will be interdisciplinary and it will be typically multinational. Decade project is a more discussed and focused, generally shorter duration interpreted as being less than one year and will typically contribute to a decade ocean program. Decade activity will support an outcome, objective, program or project. Typically a one-off standalone, could be a meeting, could be a conference um, um, seminar. And can form part of a program project or can relate directly to a decade objective. And decade contribution is essentially a supporting mechanism to allow people to be recognized for their support to the development of the decade of ocean science. And at this point, I'd like to say a big thank you to the Honor Frost Foundation because without their travel assistance, some of us would not have been able to attend these meetings and gain an insight into how the, the bigger picture communities is going to interact together. Next slide, please. And I precede what is actually on the implementation um, website to say that actions will contribute to achieving the decade ob objectives, accelerate and generate new knowledge and understanding. Data is made available in recognized open access repositories, international and multi-stakeholder partnerships, capacity development. I haven't said too much about that, except the Cooch is, is quite well involved with international capacity, particularly in developing states. And I think we have a role to play in that. And there is also a strong emphasis on gender, generational and geographic and cultural diversity with a big focus on the younger generation taking over in, in a decade's time. And next slide, please. And to finish, for those of you who may be familiar with SASMAP, I thought this quotation here epitomized what we're trying to achieve within the decade of ocean science. This fantastic synergy, the beauty of working with different disciplines and achieving a goal, geologists and geophysicists working with archaeologists to develop something of benefit to both parties. That was through the Danish Geological Society and fundamental to the SASMAP project. And for those of you who require more information, there's a, a, a website uh, link there, but the SASMAP project finished in 2015, but were it to be created in 2020, 2021, it would be a perfect fit for the decade of ocean science. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Chris, for this very interesting um, uh, presentation indeed. And uh, as you demonstrated, and I think you are completely right on this, uh, it's not just a matter of ocean scientists providing data for archeologists uh, to work with, and it's not also the matter of archaeologists providing data for ocean scientists, but it is more like working together side by side for the sake of, uh, of the oceans and for our future. And the point about data sharing is also quite critical. Um, and it requires thinking thoroughly for a mechanism of doing this because um, um, there's a bit of sensitivity about sharing data when it comes to different countries and different backgrounds and different cultures, uh, if you understand what I mean. So, so definitely sharing information between uh, not just ocean scientists and archaeologists, but different stakeholders, as you mentioned, is, is quite crucial and important um, and, and will save a lot of time in this. So thank you very much for your fine presentation. I really appreciate it. Uh, our next speaker will be um, Andrew Viduka from the University of New England, Australia. Uh, Department of Archaeology and Paleontology, and uh, Andrew will uh, speak about engaging the marine science community in underwater culture heritage, tales from O's. I'm not sure what O's is, so I guess Andrew will explain to us what O's is. So uh, I thought it's the Wizard of O's, but I'm not sure. Uh, so let's, the word is, is, is yours, Andrew. Go ahead, please. 
Thanks, Emmett. You're right, it is Oz, and that's the shortening for it. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Andy Viduka said, and happy Oceans Day to everyone. Look, tonight I'm going to take a bit of a different tack to some of my other colleagues, and I'm going to draw back the veil on case studies in Australia. I'm going to look at some of the successful case studies and some of the not so successful ones where we've tried to align social, cultural outcomes with marine science. Because I think it's important to emphasise that this has not just happened coming into the decade of ocean science. Rather, there has been at least 30, 40, 50 years of people trying to collaborate variously successfully. And now we're coming into the ocean decade. And this is really our time to emphasise that we as the maritime archaeology community really need to step up here and try and push forward with this integration. So that's what we're going to look at today. Getting here. So one of the things that's really important to, to draw everyone's attention to is the, the scale. And I, I love that uh, image by Fraser showing the plethora of dots all around the world. In Australia, we have that cluster around the coast. And I, I'm pretty sure if Helen Farr's work is going to continue on and they're going to have a decent resolution, they're going to be finding a number of wrecks in that project, particularly up in the northern part of Australia. As you can see, we've got three oceans around us with seas to the north. We've got a distribution of wrecks, uh, generally fairly good with a big cluster down in the southeast corner. And the way you look at this as a scientist is, oh my God, I have got seven and a half thousand wrecks sunk since 1622 made of multiple materials. I couldn't set up an experiment better than this at all. And this is just an incredible resource that we have never really successfully engaged with the marine science community to take the similar passion to it. But we can, and there are opportunities going forward. From my perspective, any site needs to be looked at from both a cultural and natural lens. And what we've got to do is how to make sure that we bring that in. And later on, I'm going to talk about the need to have those sort of collaborations. Since the 60s in Australia, when we started with field work on maritime archaeology, and it was actually on terrestrial sites associated with the Batavia, it was only in the early 1970s that the first underwater stuff happened. Since then, we've had a fairly ad hoc approach to successfully including natural science. And so let's have a, take that veil apart and let's now look at where the system is now and look at a few case studies. So a lot of the speakers have pointed out these objectives around the, the decade of ocean science and the needs and opportunities for collaboration. I think it's just critically important to say that these have a cultural as well as a, a natural lens to them as well. Now, certainly other speakers will talk on this, but quite clearly, we have a space and a role to communicate in here and to be active but we also have enormous opportunity and challenges to be active in that space. So let's actually work through those challenges. So in Australia, looking at the macro stuff at the moment, in Australia, we've got very few national research vessels. Literally, you're seeing, seeing them there on the screen. The largest national research vessel is the RV Investigator. And for you to apply for a project on the RV investigator, your application for sea time gets given to a committee who then reviews that. It's quite obvious that that committee is driven largely for the natural sciences, and you don't see a, a very diverse breakup of other types of sciences within that group. So from our perspective as a social science moving forward, we're very encouraged that the RV investigator and the marine national facility that runs that are flagging a review of their policies coming into this decade of ocean science to make sure that other factors can be considered in applications, which will include, of course, the social sciences, and maybe even to change the makeup or, or, or look of the board of the committee that actually considers these. So these are very, very, very promising steps by the marine national facility to be ready to deliver the critical outcomes of the ocean decade, which is absolutely fantastic. So where we are here, I'm going to give you some mixed results here. Uh, uh, most of them 
uh, I've drawn from my own experience since I tend to get very negative results often. So I thought I'd just share that with you. Um, so to give you an example, we've, a number of people have applied for very specific projects to do which are culturally focused. And in that instance, I give Dr. Brad Duncan's efforts to get the HMS Voyager um, survey up. This is a very famous collision in Australia, which resulted in, in the loss of many people's lives and, and the wreck going down. Brad has applied several times unsuccessfully for this as a primary project. But what we're finding is with the Marine National Facility, we've been much more successful at getting transit voyages, which means it's more ad hoc and opportunistic chances to use the facility while it's transferring from one task to another. Take what you get. That's what we're in in this space. And so we've had a very positive result with uh, at least getting a, a small transit voyage there that wasn't quite successful in discovering anything, but it's a start. So let's go with the start. I've recently applied for a project uh, working for biodiversity and culture in the Indian Ocean. That wasn't successful. Taking out the culture, the biodiversity project got successful. Again, that's just the, the emphasis of the committee. And previously I've been involved in the Lexington project where we got 55 days of sea time but unfortunately we were unsuccessful at getting the funding for the United States people to come out and that caused that project to fall over. So again, there has been a mixed bag of results in getting the large equipment. More recently, uh, Emily Jatif from the National Maritime Museum was successful in being on a voyage which found an iron crown and that was using data from the Maritime Archaeology Association of Victoria and Heritage Victoria. And she's also been working on uh, standard operating procedures for reporting of discovery of sites by all the marine national vessels. We've also um, previously just been successful with uh, Dr. Rob Beeman from James Cook University. He was um, a co-PI with myself, and, and but Rob led the field work on the boat, which uh, most likely discovered the USS Neosho. Uh, it's a longer story than the time allows here, but effectively from a whole mounted sonar, finding down to 3,000 as a meters, we've got a target that looks very promising to follow up with a natural and cultural focused survey of that specific site in the future, and that will be an application going forward. Um, aligning heritage outcomes and science outcomes can be in different formats, and in this one, I was successful when managing the Ongala site to actually encourage the utilization of the protected zone around the site so that they would place one of nine national reference monitoring systems, which we call the IMOS voice. And these collect a range of key data, which you can see here in front of you. That data is actually used to understand baseline changes for climate change and coastal environment. So it's very important and it's fantastic that cultural heritage has got a role in that. We've also got the smaller micro projects which have been interfacing, and this is where I'm getting back into that ad hoc approach. In 1987, Peter Harvey from Heritage Victoria was the first person to actually do a, a pre-disturbance survey which included a natural, cult, natural lens in Australia. That survey was uh, fantastic. And so in when Dr. Peter Veff and myself were looking at finding a site to run the Australian Historic Shipwreck Preservation Project, we used that as the basis because it gave us the best longitudinal data to kick off that project. Now that was a very good project and the, the natural component of that study because it was looking at in situ reburial of sites was led by Vicky Richards from West Australia Museum. So that was a very successful project with good outcomes and potentiality in the future too. For places which have been managed very successfully or, or very intensively, you often get a very good uh, lens of natural and cultural values uh, being looked at across the sites. And probably the key example for that is the Yongala shipwreck here, which is Australia's best known dive tourism site and one I managed for time. In the Yongala, while I was working there, um, I, I was working with a chap called Thomas Steglitz out of uh, James Cook University. Thomas was looking at a range of things. And in doing this multi-beam that you're seeing going around at the moment, Thomas was able to discover um, bioturbation around the site. So this came out the whole story. Now, just because I'm moving quickly here, I just want to emphasize a critical thing. With the introduction of my citizen science project, Gert Scientific Divers, Australia now has for the first time an opportunity where a program specifically includes citizen scientists who are going to look at monitoring the conservation conditions of a site 
and include into that citizen science, which actually works in that area around natural heritage. Now, this is going to be uh, functioning into the future. It's already operating in three countries at this time. So hopefully over this period of time and into this next decade, we'll see this citizen science approach where the public lead in documenting sites and using established citizen science programs with very robust data for comparable analysis going forward. So I think that's all I need to say at this time. Thank you very much for having me. Cheers. Thank you very much, Andrew, uh, for this uh, for this insight from Australia. And it seems that organisations like the Marine National Facility, which are actually rethinking their policies and now thinking more of the culture aspect as well as the natural aspect, this is a huge change. And some of the projects that you you mentioned were like best practices that uh, should be promoted and uh, and uh, publicised more so. It can give ideas to other institutions and other organizations and even other countries to do something similar. Um, this is very informative. Thank you very much. And especially the Yolanga project is, is really very informative. Thank you very much, Andrew, for this. And uh, our next speaker would be uh, Calliope. Um, Calliope Baiga from the UNESCO Chair in Maritime and Coastal Archaeology at the University of Aix-Marseille in France. And uh, Calliope uh, will uh, talk to us about engaging the public uh, the ocean's past in, uh, is important for the ocean's future. Um, Calliope, it's, the floor is yours. Hello, Max. Thank you very uh, much. Actually, I'm going to talk um, about uh, the, a day on the beach, working together on coastal environments, interdisciplinary research, public engagement, and coastal policies. And actually, from the high seas and the deep ocean, we propose today today a stroll on the beach. And in the UNESCO chair project in ex Marseille University, coastal archaeology is a big priority. Therefore, as most of us watch and experience the ocean from the coastline, and indeed human activities are um, mainly concentrated on the coastline where we live. While living in local communities and world capitals, and fishing industry is operating, offshore industries are installed. I don't know if I can change my slides. I'm sorry for this. I'm not changing slides. Sorry for this. Uh, uh, is, is this something that you can help with? No, is it okay? Do you see me now? Yeah, yeah, it's working yes. fine. Yes. And uh, you can see the next slide? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I was saying that human activities are concentrating on the oceans and the fire we have uh, uh, our cities and our fishing industries and the um, the fish offshore industries, but we also have cultural heritage. Cultural heritage is an interface between land and sea that connects our past and our future. Modern cities are developing and coexisting with old ones, and these are places that strengthen feelings of belonging and understanding, and by themselves are an interdisciplinary zone of research. As an Africa does draw my attention to the Pericles project that proposed to map coastal and maritime cultural heritage that matters to you and approach to see not only shipwrecks and harbors in the maritime cultural heritage, but also poetry, songs, mythology, and art. And I admit that playing the game, I mostly map food. The UN has recognized the importance and the vulnerability of the coastal zones of the planet and already colleagues mentioned the sustainable development goals such as resilient cities, climate action, pollution, and marine coastal ecosystems. In 2008, the protocol on integrated coastal zone management was signed, and um, the aim is to protect the coastal zone and help them deal with the emerging coastal and intermetal challenges. These are made mainly man-made hazards as an um, overpopulation, and unregulated urban de development, more than 600 million people live today in low elevation coastal areas, 
less than 10 meters below sea level. And to this, we must add mass tourism evolution. Most severe, of course, is climate change and the increase of glo global temperature. Uh, sea level rise is accelerating. And um, in a good scenario, we, we are going to have a sea level rise of 30 to 40 centimeters by 2100. And the human dimension of this will be considerable. On the same time, we experience extreme weather events and coastlines are rapidly eroding, putting in risk the resilience of modern and ancient cities. Storm surges and coastal erosion threaten big number of UNESCO World Heritage Sites and make it not forgotten the flooding of Venice in 2018. And at the same time, sea level risk put at risk historical site as the Cosquer Cave in southern France, famous for the Paleolithic paintings and engravings. Finally, in the intertidal areas of the Atlantic coast of France, recent storms of 2012, 13 and 14 have revealed new wrecks, have dislocated others, and have allowed systematic research on some by the colleagues with the Drasma in very challenging conditions. Now, the vision of the Ocean Decade is stimulate and coordinate interdisciplinary research efforts at all levels. In this vision, it is essential to add the historical coastline. In front of this big challenge and opportunity, marine geoscience and coastal archaeology are already working together on the coastline, sharing common goals. These are develop our understanding of vulnerability and natural hazards and increase resilience and in order to influence local policies. In this constantly changing environment, the study and the last game construction of coastal settlements and harbors need the collaboration of many scientists. And on the other hand, as already mentioned, geoscience need an archaeological perspective. Therefore, an inter inter interdisciplinary approach in including archaeology, is already solidly integrated in the coastal environment, natural and cultural. Coastal archaeology projects, thus, they are necessarily designed as interdisciplinary adventures. And here an example, some photos from the Kilini Harbour project, a big extensive submerged and coastal remains dating from the classical and the medieval period of the ancient and medieval harbor of Kilini. This is a very challenging environment that needs interdisciplinary approaches, including archaeological documentation, of course, topography, archaeology, underwater excavation, remote sensing technologies, and satellite imagery. We need the need of ge geologists and oceanographers with such kind of sonar, sabotone profile, and magnetometer and bithometric studies, coastal and marine geophysical studies, the vibracorins, electrosystemic surveys, paleoenvironmental studies, underwater and coastal in situ conservation, as well as um, um, archaeometric analysis. Moreover, um, experimentation for adapting the existing instruments to the shallow and very shallow water is part of um, the challenging of studying this kind of environment. Now, why the study of coastal and submerged settlements are important is because they help us understand future trends regarding sea level rise, pollution, coastal erosion, and marine geohazard between some that already UNESCO has recognized. And this is the information that we also get from international projects uh, everywhere in the world. And moreover, archaeological inf information provides precise dates. These help contextualize geo geo geological data, especially as far as the study of the sea level reconstructions are concerned for the past and the future. Therefore, archaeological research is already integrated in many interdisciplinary um, projects and European projects. Chris already mentioned SASMA project for the development of tools and techniques to, dance, to access, stabilize, and monitor underwater archaeological sites. Flaskos for the submerged 
the coastlines of Europe. And I would like to add a new one that just started, Neanias, and an Horizon 2020 project that will provide innovative services at the European Open Science Cloud. And here, all scientific fields are joining forces, the atmosphere, the underwater, and the space sector. The final frontier is engaging the public. The study of local coastal cultural heritage is a powerful tool to reinforce the identity of local communities, strengthening the historical cultural awareness. This is best achieved by opening the research sites to the local population. And indeed, this is one of the best moments of the excavations. We are organizing open days where people can visit the remains and actually get to know the archaeology that lay in front of their feet for centuries. This also gives us the opportunity of changing perspectives and exploring with them the cultural heritage that matters to them and not only to our scientists. So coastal heritage is a powerful tool for reconnecting to our own identity, to our own memory, and this is the force that will drive all of us in protecting and revitalizing the coasts we live on. Of course, cultural and natural coastal heritage cannot be perceived, studied, and managed if they are not studied together. Again, only scientific knowledge and local commitment can effectively influence national and international coastal policies. Therefore, the Ocean's Decade is a unique opportunity to prepare the next day on the beach in 2030 and beyond. Entering coastal geological research in the scientific agenda is essential, as well as empowering local coastal communities and sharing interdisciplinary data worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Calliope. Uh, we definitely miss uh, being on the beach. Um, so uh, we hope that we can go back soon. Um, I mean, thank you very much for touching on all these different aspects and topics that link uh, between uh, coastal archaeology and marine science. And uh, I sincerely hope that we have among our uh, attendees and obvious uh, uh, ocean scientists um, who can see the extent of the interdisciplinary approaches and opportunities that, uh, that Calliope has demonstrated. So thank you very much for this. It's really uh, eye-opening one. Um, uh, our next uh, presenter will be... Um, uh, Helena Barbara from the uh, uh, Underwater Archaeology um, uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula and the Underwater Archaeology Vice Director of the National Institute of Anthropology and History in Mexico. And of course, she is um, a member of the UNESCO uh, Scientific and Technical Advisory Body for the 2001 Convention. Uh, welcome, Helena. And uh, her presentation will be about seeing the uh, underwater culture heritage, uh, human traces on the seabed. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Matt, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Good afternoon, Europe, Africa, and Asia. Good night, Oceania. Good morning, America. I want to thank you for the invitation to participate in this important forum. Uh, this event is an excellent opportunity to exchange between all the science related to the research of our ocean seas and coast. Today, uh, a video has been prepared of the underwater cultural heritage, an important part of the historical memory of the humanity. Please uh, run the video. The ocean's past underwater archaeology and ocean sciences. One decade of ocean science for sustainable development. 2021-2030. Seeing the underwater cultural heritage, human traces on the seabed. MSC Elena Barba Meineke. The United Nations Decade of Ocean Sciences for Sustainable Development 2021-2030 raises the need for a deep multidisciplinary understanding of ocean processes, where research is aimed at finding solutions through scientific knowledge. 
In this sense, the research generated for decades by various countries through programs and projects around the underwater cultural heritage is nowadays a great value for the scientific knowledge and understanding of the oceans, seas and coasts. The underwater cultural heritage, made up of paleontological, archaeological, and historical evidence, is submerged and semi-submerged in marine, interiors, and on continental waters, as well as on the coast of our planet. This heritage represents an important part of the cultural memory of the peoples of humanity and is a non-renewable resource and in constant danger of disappearing. Among the main factors that lurk and threaten it are the looting, the lack of information and awareness of some governments, the incursion of treasure hunting in national territories, its commercialization, the collecting of cultural property and its illicit trafficking as well as the intensive and trawling fishing. In addition to the above, the construction of public works, an enhancement without planning and supervision, in addition to the lack of knowledge regarding the legislation, its attention and its due application. The studies of his heritage through underwater archaeology and related disciplines represent today a valuable contribution to scientific knowledge about the oceans, seas and coastal areas. An example of this is the generation of scientific information related to the process of climatic changes from a paleontological and historical point of view. They are too, each one of the shipwrecks that lie submerged in the oceans, seas and coasts, which have become over the centuries artificial reefs that generate life that provide environmental services through the absorption of carbon dioxide, action that contributes to mitigate to climate change, keeping our planet safe and breathable. In addition to the above, his study represents the safeguard of a currently submerged historical memory, which is part of the cultural legacy of the peoples of the world. Regarding the Latin American and Caribbean region, countries such as Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Cuba, Costa Rica, Ecuador, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Jamaica, Paraguay, Peru and Mexico have developed, in some cases for decades ago, intense work around the protection, conservation, research, dissemination and habilitation for your access of this heritage, investigating in a multidisciplinary way both underwater, archaeological context, in marine and interior waters and coasts. To mention some examples, in Mexico, Studies are carried out focused on the natural and cultural paleontological heritage immersed in the cave systems of the Yucatan Peninsula. These spaces reach 900 kilometers and part of them are flooded. Its exploration and study have shown that inside it is valuable information for understanding and processes related to climatic changes that occurred at the end of the last ice age, known as Worm or Wisconsin, during the Pleistocene period, since it remains intact. In these true submerged time capsules, Primary archaeological context consisting of bone remains of extinct and extant animals have been identified that mainly inhabited the eastern coast region during the Ice Age when the caves were dry. Animals and hominids entered these cavities in search of fresh water for consumption and shelter as evidenced by the archaeological evidence recorded in the caves of Hoyo Negro, Las Palmas, Najaron, and Actunja. Cooling phases such as the recent Dryas phenomenon occur between 12,700 and 11,500 with its decrease in sea level and its subsequent increase of approximately 100 meters. Around 10,000 BC, our phenomena studied through various disciplines together, included the geology and underwater archaeology, the results of which today provide valuable information of the climatic changes that occur during the Pleistocene. The research led by the archaeologists Pilar Luna Herreguerena, RIP, INA, Mexico, 
in the Hoyo Negro cave located on the coast of Tulum, Quintana Roo, stands out. This project has developed quality scientific research incorporating the most outstanding specialists in paleoecology, geology, paleontology, physical, anthropology, speleodiving, and underwater archaeology in Mexico, North America, and Canada. In this cave, 60 meters deep, and access through various tunnels and cenotes, the skeletal remains of 49 animals have been identified, of which 25 bones correspond to eight extinct species. There are skeletons of saber-toothed tiger, four species of sluts, various species of bears, gonfotherias, various felines, canids and reptiles, among others highlighting the identification of new species such as that of the land giant sloth Nohochichak Shivalbachkar. Undoubtedly, the discovery of the skeleton of the oldest woman on the American continent, known as Naya, is a watershed in terms of research on underwater cultural heritage. This woman lived and died between 13,000 and 12,000 BC. An approximate age between 15 and 17 years gave birth on at least one occasion and suffered from severe malnutrition. Derived from mitochondrial DNA studies, it is inferred that the skeleton corresponds to the D1 subhaplogroup of Asian origin, whose ancestors lived in Beringia before entering the American continent. Naya is one of the ten pre-ceramic human skeletons found in the East Coast region and is among the six scientifically dated as the oldest in America. The use of 3D model technology has made it possible to analyze the Hoyo Negro cave and the surrounding tunnels. This technology allows excellent planning of underwater archaeological work, achieving the registration and collection of ecofacts and paleontological remains for their delayed study in the laboratory, which includes analysis of radiocarbon dating, carbon and oxygen isotopes, strontium and lead isotopes, as well as uranium thorium. Thanks to the contributions of various disciplines, geofacts and specimens have been identified that are contributing to the paleontological reconstruction of the area. Among them, we have studied speleothemes, stalactites and stalagmites clusters of calcite from 19,000 years ago and shells, as well as families of plants, coal, and seeds of guanopiles, materials that date from the Paleo-Indian period between 12,000 and 9,000 years BC. This type of researches has generated valuable paleontological parameters around a better understanding of the processes of climate change, a factor that led to the extinction of numerous species. These studies and their extrapolation to other disciplines are essential for a better understanding of the process of climate change that we are currently experiencing. Likewise, in the marine waters corresponding to the Gulf of Mexico, the Mexican Caribbean, and the Pacific Ocean, more than 400 underwater archaeological contexts have been located, whose range of temporality is between the 16th and first half of the 20th centuries. Among the most outstanding examples that are being investigated in the waters of the Mexican territory are the studies around the Manila Galleon of the coast of Baja California, as well as on the creeks located in Banco Chinchorro, the Alacranes Reef, the Campeche Bank, Veracruz and coastal zone of the Yucatan Peninsula, Mexico. To these are added the thousands of sites submerged in ocean waters around the world where various countries develop high-level projects related to the investigation, conservation, monitoring and enhancement of underwater cultural heritage. 
this multidisciplinary work is sometimes carried out on board oceanographic vessels applying new technologies including three-dimensional and robotic for sensing and recording, even in Ray Deep, work linked to the creation of skills of young people under the scheme of gender equality and integration of local and indigenous groups. In parallel, achieving the adequate visibility of these scientific investigations with the aim of generating responsible and democratic access is an uninterrupted task. In this sense, the UNESCO 2001 Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage has awarded the Best Practices Badge to 12 initiatives promoted by five of its state's parties, Spain, Portugal, France, Slovenia and Mexico. Among the initiatives to make Mexico's underwater cultural heritage visible are the implementation of the Museum of Underwater Archaeology, Mursup, Fort of Juan José el Alto, located in the World Heritage City, San Francisco de Campeche. The habilitation of the public visit and investigation of the Greeks located in the Banco Chinchorro Biosphere Reserve and the project of dissemination and interaction with indigenous groups in the Nevado de Toluca. In relation to Marsub, this museum has an inclusive according to the social diversity with didactic museological and museological strategies on scientific knowledge, the product of research in underwater archaeological context and coastal populations. Through the audiovisual, sound, tactile, interactive and recreational experience, equal and democratic access to knowledge is achieved with a special emphasis on children, youth, indigenous groups and people with disabilities, generating adequate social awareness regarding the safeguarding of the underwater cultural heritage within the framework of sustainable tourism. This heritage protected by the 2001 UNESCO Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage and by national laws constitutes a unique and unreparable legacy of humanity. As part of the exploration of the new ocean frontier, it is essential to involve the protection and study of our past submerged in the roadmap of the decade of oceanic sciences, since the expertise achieved around underwater cultural heritage for decades grants to the historical memory of the oceans quality scientific support for the preservation and restoration of ocean ecosystems by strengthening in actions around the adequate sustainable development of its resources. The underwater natural and cultural heritage is always in danger of disappearing. It is our duty to preserve it today for the enjoyment of present and future generations. Thank you. San Francisco de Campeche, Campeche, Mexico, June 8, 2020. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you, Helena. This is, uh, this is very interesting. I think it's a very good idea. I mean, um, the video could be utilized as, a, as an excellent education and, and public outreach tool, I think so. And uh, perhaps that makes me think, I mean, maybe uh, Lazar and Ricky, we can discuss this at the end, but perhaps our next step could be actually producing um, a video uh, on the link between ocean science and uh, and archaeology, um, an educational and outreach tool. I mean, this would be very, very informative if we can use some of this material and some of other materials for other projects like the Black Sea Project and other to form something, you know, um, short and informative and use it as um, a means of uh, public awareness and dissemination. That could be our next uh, our next step. Thank you very much, Helena, for this. It's very interesting. Thank you. Um, our Thank you next, uh, next presenters will be um, uh, Anthony Firth, director of the Fjord Marine uh, and Historical Environment Consulting, and Athena Trakadas from the National uh, uh, Museum of Denmark. And they will talk about the Ocean Decade Heritage Network, joining hands for comprehensive research.
Anthony, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Emma. Okay, so uh, I'll just um, turn on my screen. I should be coming with you quite shortly. Okay, so I hope you can see that. So, uh, yes, um, my name is Anthony Firth. I'm presenting on behalf of myself and Athena Trakadas, who's also here on the panel. And we are the co-chairs of the Ocean Decade Heritage Network, or uh, ODHN. And we're very glad to be here on to be here on World Ocean Day, and very grateful to the organisers for inviting us to take part in this amazing meeting. Now, ODHN is a, a network for people who are interested in heritage, archaeology, and other disciplines concerned with human culture and history, including both tangible and intangible cultural heritage. And I'd like to thank the Honor Frost Foundation and the Danish National Commission for UNESCO for their support for ODHN. Now, taking our cue from Ocean, ODHN encompasses all aspects of cultural heritage that are touched by the sea. Uh, marine, maritime, nautical, submerged underwater, intertidal, coastal, literal, archipelagic. We also take on board the value of source to sea perspectives in recognizing the importance of rivers and inland waters in understanding human relations human relationships uh, with ocean through time. And for the purposes of ODHN, such disciplinary distinctions are less important than the need for us all to connect. The decades documentation makes it clear that ocean science is interpreted broadly as encompassing social sciences and human dimensions. This is helpful as investigation of cultural heritage often involves us in blending natural sciences with social sciences and humanities in our day-to-day -day activities. It's entirely normal for us to use and advance hard sciences to obtain data from the seafloor, to undercover details of past environments, or to understand and conserve fragile materials, for example. But it's also entirely normal to interpret such data from perspectives within the humanities, or to frame the value and importance of heritage to current communities in terms of the social sciences. At the moment, ODHN has two broad purposes to raise awareness of cultural heritage in the ocean decade, and to raise awareness of the ocean decade amongst people with interest in cultural heritage. So if you're interested in any of the many relationships between cultural heritage and the ocean decade, please join ODHN and participate in building these relationships over the next 10 years. We're fast approaching the start of the ocean decade, or to give it its long title, the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, 2021 to 2030. The key point about this long title is that decade actions are directed to delivering sustainable development. That is to say, to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, of the 2030 Agenda. Investigating cultural heritage to achieve the 2030 Agenda in the marine environment presents us with a great challenge. And this challenge is echoed in the decade's mission, which is to generate and use knowledge for the transformational action needed to achieve a healthy, safe and resilient ocean for sustainable development by 2030 and beyond. This emphasizes to us all that the ocean decade is about substantive change in outcomes for the people and the sea, but it is also about substantive change in the way that we conduct ourselves in the heritage sector. One transformation that's already occurring is the recognition that ocean sciences need to work more closely with the social sciences and humanities as indicated by the earlier point about scope. Scientific evidence alone has not proved sufficient to change people's behaviors to each other and to their environment. Achieving change requires engagement with people based on an appreciation of the diverse contexts in which they live. Change, making things different in future, also means understanding how people have given rise to the current state of the marine environment through historical processes. Understanding relationships between people and the marine environment through time lies at the core of ocean science for sustainable development. And it also lies at the core of the Ocean Decade Heritage Network. ODHN was formed just over a year ago in connection with the first global planning meeting of the Ocean Decade in Copenhagen in May 2019. Since then, we've been building the case for cultural heritage as an integral component of the implementation plan for the decade. The implementation plan has seven societal outcomes. We've already sketched out how cultural heritage and its investigations can contribute to each of these outcomes. Over the coming decade, 
elaborate, elaborating the contribution that heritage makes to these outcomes will be a large part of what ODHN does as we ensure that cultural heritage becomes built in to decade programs, projects and activities. The decade also presents an opportunity to consider the current character and capacities of the ocean heritage sector. Among its objectives, the decade is seeking to increase global capacity and capability for transformative ocean science. This is certainly an objective we need to address in the heritage sector where capacity and capabilities are very unevenly distributed around the world. The decade also seeks to expand knowledge systems globally, including integrating traditional experiential and local knowledge. This is an opportunity too, to ensure that the cultural heritage of the oceans becomes more representative of perspectives from around the world. This means that the Ocean Decade Heritage Network is not just a forum for addressing the UN Ocean Decade, it's a forum within which the future of ocean heritage can be shaped. So far, we've raised the voice of ocean heritage in planning for the decade, including in region, regional meetings. We've also sought to raise the profile of heritage in discussions with other ocean sciences, including natural sciences and social sciences. And we've been raising awareness of the decade and the opportunities it presents to people within the heritage sector, including among early career researchers. ODHN is also seeking to build contacts with other key networks whose interests and approaches overlap, including the Climate Heritage Network, Ocean's Past Initiative, and Mars Oxi. Through these dialogues and our expanding membership, we hope that ODHN can serve as a decade stakeholder platform, coordinating a range of heritage actions that help deliver the objectives of the decade and thereby the SDGs. If you're interested in any aspect of cultural heritage linked to the ocean, then please take a look at the ODHN website and become a member of our network. Follow the discussion on Twitter and join in. Send us blogs on the relationship between ocean heritage, the ocean decade and the SDGs that we can add to the ODHN website. Be a spokesperson for ocean heritage and ocean science meetings. Above all, join hands and get involved as we prepare, prepare for a transformative decade for ocean heritage to help achieve the ocean we want. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, so uh, is, is Athena presenting as well? No, sorry, that's uh, just, just myself. I'm speaking on behalf of Athena too. Okay, thank you very much for this. Um, um, I, I mean, I, I don't know how many people from the audience or from the attendees know actually about the ODHN. And I think this is something that should be promoted. Uh, it's an excellent platform. Um, and I join Anthony in encouraging everyone to join and follow this initiative because I think the wider the network is, the more effective it's going to be. Um, as, as Olundu mentioned in the very beginning, uh, talking to uh, the other side of the, of, the, uh, of the aspect or the ocean scientist or the the, um, the natural side, uh, side of it rather than the, uh, only the cultural side. And I think a wider network is required definitely uh, to, to, uh, to disseminate this idea. And uh, the ODHN is an, is an excellent example for this. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony, for your presentation. Thank you, Imad. Thank you. Um, well, our next presenter would be um, uh, Ahmed Shazli, Dr. Ahmed Shazli, uh, from the Department of Oceanography at the University of Alexandria. And uh, Dr. Ahmed has been um, involved actually, actually with us uh, at the uh, Center for Metamarchaeology for several years now. And he's teaching a course on oceanography at the center. And this is um, the first involvement from my point of view between oceanographers and uh, marine archaeologists at the Alexandria University. And I see it's very successful. And I hope this is gonna, gonna continue. Uh, so Dr. Ahmed will present, uh, give a presentation about marine science in the context of archaeology. Ahmad, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Ahmed, for uh, the uh, introduction and for the uh, presentation. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, very glad to be here uh, among uh, this uh, great uh, collection of uh, marine archaeologists and the uh, ocean uh, scientists as well. Um, actually, I will start from um, what have been mentioned by uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Ahmed uh, about uh, 20 years ago, um, 
they, they were calling the archaeologists. They are those guys who are working uh, on humanities. And here uh, we are we having the uh, the uh, uh, never end the never answered questions: uh, who is uh, more important, science or humanities? Uh, but actually, I have no answer, and no one has uh, answered with uh, to this uh, question. Um, as uh, I remember, 20 years ago uh, in Alexandria University, as well when I was a student in in the in the, the University of Alexandria, we have a great um, uh, project about uh, the um, in the Eastern Harbor of Alexandria uh, about underwater cult cultural heritage, and uh, I remember that. Um, around um, five or six um, degrees uh, from PhD and master has been awarded, uh, actually in marine science, working on this uh, project. So I think there is no contradiction between uh, science and uh, humanities uh, at all. Um, and um, moreover, I, will, um, I, I just wanted to share with you uh, this nice uh, paper um, this is um, uh, entitled Ooids from Turkey and Egypt in the Eastern Mediterranean and the love story of Anthony and Cleopatra. Um, actually, if someone uh, who has no background in, uh, from um, marine geology or geological uh, background, he will think uh, that uh, this paper is, um, is a his paper in history or something or arts. But actually, it is a paper in marine geology based on um, a historical story uh, uh, stating that uh, the Mark Antony uh, has constructed a beach in Turkey uh, with uh, sand transported from uh, sand, very f uh, the, the, the rounded the sand, which is oiled, uh, transported from Alexandria to, uh, to Turkey. And then he, they, they are, uh, they are uh, the author uh, compared between the composition of uh, of the oils or the sand from here and there, and they are trying to uh, to show uh, the reality or the credibility of the of the story. So uh, I think uh, this is a good uh, good uh, example of how can we um, how can we uh, integrate uh, humanities and science in 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 our uh, research. Uh, moreover, I, uh, I, I am sharing this slide. Um, this is uh, the four main branches of uh, oceanography. We learned uh, this in the first class of oceanography while we, while, uh, we are in, in the university. Uh, the, we have uh, chemical oceanography dealing with uh, the properties of water uh, and uh, the ingredients of water. Uh, the marine physics or physical oceanography, uh, which is dealing with uh, fluid dynamics, uh, the currents, waves, tides, and bathymetry. Biological uh, uh, oceanography or marine biology, which deal with uh, the, uh, uh, the the plankton, the different kind of uh, of marine organisms and their interaction together, and uh, the geology, uh, which deal with the bottom and the different kind of sediments. So, um, trying to link uh, these uh, basic or classical uh, branches of uh, oceanography uh, to uh, what is uh, what has been what is, what is uh, what can we do. Uh, in uh, underwater archaeology, we are, uh, as a scientist, uh, we are doing uh, salinity uh, measurements, uh, sediment characteristics, uh, grain size, and uh, and other uh, uh, geological surveys, uh, geological experiments. We are measuring the pH, uh, uh, especially uh, in this uh, era of climate change uh, and also acidification. Uh, we are working the, in, on the coastal erosion, uh, measuring sea, sea surface temperature or sea temperature. We are mapping uh, the, 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 the ocean. We are studying the sea level change and sea level rise, suspended matter, which is very important as well for the uh, visibility for the marine archaeologists. Uh, we are, we are uh, studying or uh, doing research on the marine orga organisms and uh, their uh, impact on the marine environment, including shipwrecks and uh, artifacts and, uh, and other archaeological uh, sites. Uh, study the currents, uh, the bathymetry, of course, which is very important. Uh, seismic surveys, groundwater, sediment transport, which is, uh, I think, essential in, in uh, underwater uh, cultural uh, research. Uh, and uh, as well the tide. So I think um, these, uh, those are some parameters or factors uh, that constitute uh, the basics of 
oceanography uh, and marine science and uh, at the same time uh, the the uh, they are very essential to uh, underwater uh, cultural um, archaeology uh, underwater archaeology in its different techniques and phases or op operations starting from the uh, position uh, fixing uh, site surveys uh, uh, recording excavation uh, artifact recovery and conservation so uh, i think we are doing the same stuff the scientists and archaeologists um, not only the uh, the um, the uh, classical uh, work or the uh, common work of uh, of oceanography or marine science but also the uh, the application and the new uh, new uh, branches or new uh, disciplines of marine science like marine spatial planning uh, uh, now they are uh, linked to uh, archaeology or underwater culture archaeology uh, as well the blue growth or blue economy and um, some uh, countries now started to uh, consider uh, the uh, um, um, uh, archaeological coastal archaeological uh, archaeological sites uh, as a, um, a, a focus area for the blue growth or their uh, income or the blue economy uh, and more uh, so uh, to to keep to keep uh, the the time um, i will conclude with um, that we cannot conserve and sustainably use the ocean seas and marine resources for sustainable development without the integration we have to work together I encourage uh, myself and all people working on marine science uh, uh, to, to start linking their work with underwater cultural heritage. And I hope next year, while we were presenting, hopefully physically uh, in Ocean, uh, World Oceans Day to, uh, to represent my work with uh, the Alexandria Center for Underwater Cultural uh, Heritage about uh, something new uh, integrating science and uh, archaeology thank you for your attention and uh, thank you dr ahmed many thanks uh, dr ahmed thank you very much for your uh, presentation and uh, i mean it's really great to have this perspective of an, an oceanographer and to uh, i wish that this idea that you have now uh, have you have been working closely with us is going to grow and going to spread wider among more uh, scientists and more oceanographers. And I didn't know anything about this uh, beach that Mar Mark Anthony uh, created in Turkey. So I guess we should claim our land in Turkey. We have to yeah. see about this. So we have yeah, pieces yeah. of land then that we have to get back. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you very much, Ahmad, for this. I really You're appreciate really it. Thank Thanks you. A lot. Um, now to our final presenter, and it's going to be uh, Abner. Uh, Alberda from Panama, and uh, he's the coordinator and culture manager of the Panamian uh, Anthropology Group uh, and a member of the UNESCO uh, Scientific and Technical Advisory Body, the STAB. And uh, uh, Abner will talk to us about heritage and environment and interrelation. Abner, the floor is, is yours. Thank you, Professor Ahmad. Uh, Erminia, can you share the screen, please? Good evening, warm greetings to all. Thank you so much for the invitation to the Secretariat of the 2001 UNESCO Convention. I am Abner Alberda, anthropologist and master in nautical and underwater archaeology. Have you have seen my presentation? It's entitled Heritage and Environment and Interrelation. I have divided my thoughts into two parts. The first, environmental condition on the underwater archaeological heritage, and the other is the impact of anthropogenic activities on the marine ecosystem. In any part of the world, there are conditions on the underwater cultural heritage that can be caused by natural factors such as marine currents, waves, and biological communities among others, or by anthropic factors such as trollings, public wars, wandering, pollution, etc. The 2001 
UNESCO Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage rules the in-situ conservation have the first options. Therefore, the activities carried out to have to ensure the protection of the sites. Objects in aquatic environment have the advantage of being more easily preserved than those on land, especially organic ones in anoxic environments. So these integrities tend to be rich of information for understanding the past societies and the history of the oceans. Preventive conservation is a measure carried out in situ to avoid the deterioration of the objects and depends on a series of parameters such as environmental factors, type of sites, materials present, existing threats, stage in which is found, level of access, and historical and archaeological value of the object. So, data, data can be known by future generation or researchers with more advanced techniques and of less impact. We want to illustrate this environmental data with our research in the Caribbean of Panama through nine areas with shipwreck potential and their characteristics. One, temperature. The amount of dissolved oxygen and the temperature of the water are closely related as it decreases with temperature. A fundamental factor in the deterioration of archaeological materials. Temperature throughout the year in the Panamanian Caribbean range from 25 to 29 degrees. Two, salinity. The longer as an object stays in the water, the greater the salt penetration is. The and therefore, the longer it stays to be treated. This value in our area remains high due to evaporation at the missing in the surface layer. Three, dissolved oxygen present around the object condition its preservation or deterioration, which varies in the different part of the same object. Dissolved oxygen decreases with depth and temperature. The minimum sum of Salt oxygen are generally found between 200 and 1,500 meters depth. But the most of our known seed breakers in Panama are found at a less of 60 meters depth, which is why they are very affected. There are several activities after the formation of the archaeological sites that alter the integrity of the site and the environment where they are located. One, fishing and recreational diving. Bocas del Toro is one of the most tourist areas of Panama. The reasons are crystalline water and environmental richness. It is located in the western part of the country towards to the border with Costa Rica. It is close to the Punta de Bastimentos and Hospital Bay, where ethnographic interview have allowed us to learn about the presence of two sites. The first one is a very large anchor and is covered with coral and a depth of 18 meters. The other is a depth of a metal chip at a depth of about nine meters in the water of Solarte Island in the Almirante Bay. Two, anchoring and snorkeling. The indigenous region of Gunayala is one of the favorite areas for anchoring in boats or yachts dedicated to the tourism. In Perro Island, it is another metal boat that 
what she broke in the middle of the last century after a collision with Arif. On the island of Chishime, the most colorful of the island, there is a metal bow stranded on a coral reef. Gunayala is rich in underwater cultural heritage and knowledge of traditional boat building called Ulu in the local language. Three, underwater archaeology. Although there is no specific study of the impact of archaeological activities on marine ecosystem in our area, archaeological activities alter marine ecosystem and can be very destructive. In this sense, we can find evidence of this destruction in the activities of the extraction of archaeological materials related to the San Jose Galeon of Panama, described by the mission of the staff in 2018. Another intervention was in Las Lajas Reef with other team, where a series of guns covered by coral and marine vegetation were extracted and placed in treatment. As you can see, many of these sites are ecosystems that are strongly impacted by the activities that we, archaeologists, also carried out. Therefore, marine scientists must work together to offer mitigation measures when the extraction of this material is justified and be able to answer research questions. We, ocean scientists, have to work together to preserve our environment and pull our knowledge for understand the ocean past. Thank you. Abner, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, you have you have highlighted a lot of uh, of aspects uh, and many activities that are affecting ecosystems, which require definitely the collaboration between archaeologists and ocean scientists. And it's certainly in situ preservation is, is an interesting one. It makes me think now um, a lot of, of study that pre precedes and that uh, follows in situ preservation needs to be done by ocean scientists. I mean, prediction of, of changes of environment, uh, prediction of uh, what's going to happen to the site while it is being preserved in situ. Uh, many of this actually comes from the ocean science point of view. Uh, thank you very much for your kind presentation. Uh, very informative. Um, and um, that ends our presentations, but I now give the floor to Orike uh, to manage the uh, questions and answers. And uh, I think we have some questions already coming in through. And uh, Orike, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yes, actually, you've all been very active. Uh, again, a greeting to all our participants and your interest and your compliments. First of all, there were a lot of questions to ask if those presentations will be shared. You might have seen that we have registered this event. So we will on the UNESCO website uh, share with all of you the event's presentation and you can watch it later whenever you want, so no worries. There have also been a lot of questions about the possibilities of training. Please be informed that the, on the UNESCO website of the 2001 convention, you just put in Google UNESCO underwater, you find it, there is a little uh, a link to education and there you have a list of all our universities in the UNESCO Unitwin Underwater Ecology Network and they offer you the different uh, possibilities in your region to get training on underwater ecology also on the connection with oceanography and all these kind of issues so don't hesitate to reach out to also not hesitate to reach out to the UNESCO Secretariat if you have professional questions so now let's go to the participant questions. I just open with some of those that have been asked and uh, maybe all the presenters, all the panelists could connect back again so that we see their faces and if they can just jump in and give their opinion and their advice, please connect back to us and hopefully uh, we can keep the connection live and nothing breaks down. We are very happy that so many people have been uh, able to connect from all over the world. So first question comes from Alicia and uh, she asks, 
The recent pandemic has caused an instantaneous havoc and around the world we have seen social media being used as an active component for raising awareness by institutions such as uh, UNESCO but also NGOs, governments, whoever. Um, so that was basically about uh, the spread of the virus and certain precautions. On World Oceans Day, that is today, how can we learn from the successes and failures of an emergency awareness campaign and how can we introduce similar approaches um, to promote underwater cultural heritage oceanography and, um, you know, the cooperation and ocean protection. Please, uh, can I ask you that question? Do not hesitate to jump in and give us some guidance. Thank you. Maybe Chris Underwood could say the first word. Thanks, Ulrike. Um, Wow, that's quite a big question and uh, I'm not sure I've got a complete answer for this, but looking at the way COVID-19 has impacted on everything, um, we're going to have to address many new issues, including maybe how we work, how we inter interact with the public, how we interact with the global community. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have any absolutely clear defined answer to that. I'd have to read the question and, and perhaps come back and, and with a more thorough answer. I think we're all reeling from what's actually happening around our world. It seems to be changing everything. It's not just related to the pandemic. It seems to have stimulated social discourse, social change. And I think we are gonna get caught up in that. Um, cultural heritage is fundamental to all of those things. There are already in the past um, historical study, archeological studies of some of the things that have been mentioned regarding activities that started in the United States. But we're all involved. I watch the news every day. I see what's happening in my own country, not Argentina, let's say, but the United Kingdom, and seeing some of those dramatic events. Those are cultural changes that we're witnessing day by day, second by second. And I think they will have a, an impact on public interest in cultural heritage, and that will hopefully include underwater cultural heritage, which will bring narratives and stories, both tangible and intangible, into the public domain. I think this presents us with a, a very big opportunity to connect with the public. We're, we as anthropologists or archeologists, we connect with the public. And I think that was one of the key messaging that came out of the, the planning meeting in, in Copenhagen in 2019. The messenger, the stories that we can convey about underwater cultural heritage, both intangible and tangible to the public. And I see where, I think, just to reiterate, we're seeing social change as we speak. Every day something else is happening. And I think we have a very, very big role in recording this, obviously, but also participating in it. We're seeing indigenous populations been perhaps exposed to media that we've not seen for, for many years. And of course, if you look at the decade and its, let's say, its structure, you see cultural diversity mentioned as a key component. You see younger generations uh, as a key component. Cultural diversity. All of those things are front and center in the, in the media right now. And I think we have opportunity. And I think we can build on what's been said. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question, I just go from one to another, and please, uh, if you are a participant, do not hesitate to raise your hand if you want to intervene and say directly, uh, pose directly a question. The next question we get from Yona is, is there any intention to create maybe also larger region? Maybe if you look at Calliope, that is very typically Mediterranean. You have to you have to uh, switch on your on your microphone. Yes, to create what, Ulrike? An underwater cultural heritage route. Route, ah yes, um, maybe not in the Mediterranean yet, but uh, in uh, every country and especially countries that um, uh, have institutions in underwater archaeology. That means uh, directorships in underwater archaeology. They are now towards this um, um, direction. This is uh, France, uh, this is Greece, uh, I think it's uh, Egypt, Israel, and I think I'm missing also Spain. That means that we're trying now to 
and make open the underwater cultural site, especially the coastal underwater archaeology sites and uh, the shipwrecks, shipwrecks that are lying in a, a not very deep water so that uh, um, the public and the tourists can actually um, have a, a visit them, visit them live. Um, it's not a coordinated uh, action all over the Mediterranean, but I'm sure that um, in, the, in the next decade, it could be. Thank you very much. The next question, and I, of course, there's also uh, uh, in other regions of the world than just the Mediterranean initiatives for the roots. I look at Elena Barbara Manike, who's working on a Maya uh, Rude. Do not hesitate to intervene also in, in Spanish and we can help you with the translation. So I, I'll read to you next question. Olive Armour is uh, greeting us. Uh, uh, thank you for this interesting inspiring webinar. What are the next steps in regard to integrating underwater culture heritage into the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development? Can I give this question to Athena Tracadas? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. That's yes, great, can. okay. Yes, um, this has been a discussion of, uh, it's, it's a for all of us to, of course, uh, try and figure out what the next steps are. And we've been in participating uh, amongst ourselves in terms of our colleagues of working in the cultural heritage community and getting the word out about the ocean decade and if there's a place for us who specialize in cultural heritage in it. Uh, the other side is also trying to go to the marine science world and communicating to them what we do uh, as maritime archaeologists or people who work in cultural heritage management. And this has been something that it's been a, a light bulb on both sides because um, a lot of times uh, we are finding out that marine scientists don't know what we do or how relevant our work is to them. And so um, for me, this has been the biggest takeaway. So the next step is now is the decade is going to start uh, and it's going to be within 2021 with the announcement and the initiatives and programs. It's going to be um, even more important to critically join and get these groups together and talking to each other. So I think uh, part of this has to do with webinars like this and getting other people involved who it's one thing if we all talk to ourselves, we're all aware, very much aware of what goes on in our cultural heritage community, I think, um, but getting that word out to, to larger groups. And so I think it has to do with um, publications, but publish what you're doing, not necessarily in the same journals that you publish in, but try and get beyond uh, and more uh, broader um, marine science journals. And that's gonna take some time but that I think is the next step that we have to discuss together and see how we can do this, but also start developing projects that are more, um, as some already have been doing, like SASMAP that Chris mentioned. There's other ones, uh, of course, that have been going on, especially in Australia, especially in uh, the Americas um, and in Europe uh, that really integrate science. And it's, it's getting that word out uh, to a broader audience, not just ourselves. So, I don't have a specific answer. It's something that we we'll all have to put our heads together and it's within the next uh, six months to eight to nine months to really think about how we can best approach this process. We've tried a little bit with the Ocean Decade Heritage Network um, to, like I said, approach people who are cultural heritage specialists and approach marine scientists, but now we need to really work on the connect between the two. So any ideas? Uh, I know Ola, he's also a member of um, Ocean Decade Heritage Network and he's been really active. Um, and ideas from, from membership, from members within the Decade Network, within our broader community, um, we, we need to put our heads together and really have uh, a way forward. And so it's events like this, this webinar, that's gonna get us um, hopefully starting a dialogue about what can we do next? What is the next step? And that's something that uh, not only the panels, but the attendees, um, please give us some ideas about what to do. And just for your information, this morning, Peter Thompson's uh, UN's ocean uh, ambassador said that the UN conference in Lisbon will take place. The conference is only postponed, it's not canceled, so yeah. remain active and uh, get a stance in that. Yeah. Next question from Diana Groom. 
Um, she was very interested in the last two presentations uh, on the oceanograph uh, oceanographic, oceanic factors. So this goes to Dr. El Shadley and uh, Abner Al Derda. Um, she asked, I would like to know if any participants are presently beginning to explore the impact of climate change on rock environments and which factors they are prioritizing as likely as being most impactful. So the question is about the impact of climate change on rock environments. You don't know if you are the best one to, to answer, not if yes, and then take the floor, please. Um, um, I, I, to, to be clear, uh, you, you are asking about the impact of climate change on the um, um, coastal on heritage? On underwater ecological heritage. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, um, to, be, uh, to be focused and uh, precise, um, I can, I can uh, summarize uh, the impact of climate change on the uh, underwater sites. Uh, in uh, first uh, the ocean acidification and uh, the uh, change in the pH of the uh, of the of the water, which can impact, which of course will impact uh, the uh, the um, shipwrecks and the, the artifacts and the uh, other uh, stuff underwater, and uh, as well uh, related regarding the uh, the coastal uh, 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 shipwrecks and or the coastal underwater sites. The coastal erosion and, and the sea level rise is uh, an important uh, uh, factor of uh, or important impact of the climate change on the uh, on the uh, archaeological sites. This is from my side. Um, for me, uh, the most of, of the sites in Panama are under the water, and the climate change changing everything. I, I think because we need to to study these parameters with, with ocean scientists to define uh, the, the route to, to our research. I, I think this is very important. Um, we need to work together for, for that because we, we don't have uh, more uh, knowledge without oceanographers e for the for this deep type of, of sites yes and of course i mean that we also i have to, to tell that michel Lour from the uh, underwater ecology department of france wanted to join us and wanted to especially make me promise that uh, i translate uh, transmit the news that there is a huge issue of prehistoric sites that are washing up on the shore because the climate is changing and they are being, uh, you know, uh, also destroyed by climate change. So there is a real issue. Thank you very much. Um, does any one of the participants uh, uh, want to intervene directly? I do not see any hands, so okay. Um, yeah, please, Ahmad. And B Cesar Bita has also raised the hand. Just, just to follow from what Athena was uh, saying about the next step. Uh, I think more or less now we have we have started to um, define our goals. I mean, talking to the oceanographers and the ocean scientists, and then once we are accepted, uh, maybe we can think of what we can do together, and then we can go to actually doing it together. So there are some sort of steps that we can we can move forward. At this moment, we are in the first step, just talking to them to the community. Um, as, as we said, the webinar is, is, is okay, it's a good idea, we can do it again. Um, courses and outreach courses is, again, is a very good idea to, to, um, to talk to them in a more instructive way. And uh, as, we, we, uh, we, as I mentioned after Helena's video, videos as well are, are very widely um, uh, transmitted and they, they are on the media, they are everywhere, so we can perhaps produce something. Uh, that can explain the idea of the link between ocean science and, uh, and archaeology. UNESCO maybe can do this, and we can all contribute to it with material uh, to, to, to be more informative and easily understood and appreciated even by people who are not directly involved in archaeology or ocean science. Thank you. Yeah, great video. Thank you. Um, I give the floor to Cesar Bita. And invite him in. In the that this function, Caesar is here. 
Yeah. I hope uh, you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, good. Well, uh, we're trying to to look at the oceans around the the, the Kenyan coast, and uh, what we've come to realize is that uh, a number of um, sites are getting exposed due to to the uh, the oceans um, eating more of the land, and also uh, the ancient ports are getting covered by the the, 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 the the, the siltation that is coming from the sea. Recently, we had an experience in uh, around Malindi town where we found some sites being exposed due to the, the rising oceans where the sea has taken so much of the, the, the land and exposed some of the, the sites that are coming out now. There are also a lot of um, cultural materials from the ships that are in the sea. That's now being brought to the beach, unlike before when this never used to happen. Also around Malindi, there are some sections where you find um, uh, sites being covered and sites that were not very deep are now going far deeper into the, into, into, into the, into the sedimentation under the sea. So while there is clear uh, indication of the impacts of climate change in this part of uh, the Indian Ocean. Thank you. Yes, I try to in the same moment. Thank you, Cesar. It's great to have someone from Kenya from so far, far away joining us and uh, of course great, great projects in Malindi. Um, great to have you all on board. Um, I will look into the, the questions. Um, so there is again the question of the training for young persons interested in marriage and heritage. Please again, several of the participants are professors and also we have uh, on UNESCO website a list of our unit twin uh, uh, universities. So there is one question, what would you like to say about the increase in the illegal trafficking of cultural heritage? Uh, do we have any international regulation other than the two, uh, 2001 convention, new or old, or any future code and respect? Yes, thank you for that question. I mean, given that this is uh, asking about uh, UNESCO, of course, we have also the 1970 convention of UNESCO. And we could have uh, someone intervening on the issue of uh, uh, trafficking of uh, cultural materials. Uh, maybe I can ask this. Um, who wants to ask on that? Do you raise a hand if you want to, to volunteer? Chris, do you want to volunteer to say something about um, the illicit trafficking of cultural material? I saw just this uh, statement that came from uh, the ICOMAS International Committee of Underwater Cultural Heritage, ICUT, coming through on this issue. I would like to say something. And I think it's clear to me that um, the world needs more awareness of, not, of the broader values of cultural heritage. And, and to recognize that to go into partnership, if that, that's what happens in certain situations, which leads to, let's say, private ownership rather than public ownership, that's what I personally believe UCH and the World of Cultural Heritage should be, in public ownership, not private ownership. So, and you see, as we've seen, I, we're not sure what's happening in the Mediterranean. We're getting some information from it. But it seems that 12 or even more absolutely amazing underwater cultural heritage sites, archeological sites from the 16th century, perhaps older, perhaps much older, to suddenly we're surprised by a media announcement without any knowledge about the science-based research that, that even underpin, underpins some of these activities. And it's made worse by the fact that some of this, um, some of these activities end up as illicit trafficking and it just disappears, it evaporates with no science applied to it whatsoever. And I think that's my personal concern. This is underwater cultural heritage, cultural heritage, archaeology should be a public good. It should benefit everybody. And I think we need to perhaps, and I think to be fair to Ulrike in the 2001 convention, there's been over the last two or three years encouragement 
to join in a broader sense the aims and objectives of the different conventions that are, are not separate. They support each other. And there, is, there have been quite a few statements like that. And I think we have to work you know, a bit closer together um, within the different conventions to bring them together, to shout to the world that archaeology is a public good. The results of archaeology should also be a public good and not be hidden from us. That is the great sadness. Um, I, I think that's, I'll probably finish there because I think that's a personal view. I hope it's shared by some of my colleagues. I'm sure it is. Uh, and it, these things come as a surprise. What's happening? No science. Or maybe there is science, but we don't see it. I'm going to hand over back to Ulrike on that. Thank you very much. Actually, I think that was a very, very beautiful uh, route of closing. We are already um, half an hour late, late, but I think everyone enjoyed the webinar enormously. And uh, we can, it's on his shoulders, Emma, to, to bring us through this day. And I think that will not be the last webinar we do. It was great to have uh, these hours in your time schedule and to have you all with us so easily on such a short notice. And it was a very, very happy ocean day. And a big thank you to all our participants that have until now stayed with us, to all the delegations, all the national commissions as well that have been paying this, uh, their, their uh, attention to this webinar. Thank you for all of you. We stay in touch and we certainly do this again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.